Good morning. Welcome to the tertiary world. <clears throat> Today I'm reading from memories that I have of Ligon Street, which is the second north south street. This is memory three, the colour is yellow, and it's of 279 Ligon Street. What can you say as you remember Ligon Street in the spring of 1966? The front door of the poppy shop festooned with colour. Flowers everywhere, Giancarlo loudly and joyfully spoiling coffee in front of grinders. All you can do is smile. Young men and women walk about dreamily, spensierati in love, able to be because the body of the thing is still intact, still breathing, still all here. Today, where sacks overfilled with fragrant coffee beans once spilled onto the street, you find yet another smartly decorated cafe. Back then, the tiny part of the street between Giancarlo's and Tamani's was populated by gritty lives, being constructed bit by bit, according to the moment, to one's own moment. All those people that Piero from behind the counter engaged with his turquoise Venetian eyes the colour of the Laguna, the ones that each morning ordered their usual breakfast and over it brightly dealt out hope for others. Where are they now? Each morning even I appeared with my two slices of black bread asking Angelo to toast it before he smothered it with eggs and tomatoes while Piero busied himself with the ranchillo, making funny faces to hide the pain. How many books were written in there? How many lives were dramatically changed? How many premonitions of an early death were felt deep in the morning of an early winter? And whose writing is it that still fills the specials blackboards with the same loopy G's and H's that someone scrawled on this blackboard way back in 1970? I now sit in the early evening at a table outside on the widened pavement the same pavement that once held hurrying passers-by avoiding the traffic and jostling each other for space. The second I have this thought, I long for rain. I wish for it to team down on everything and wash it all away, wash it all bright and new and unknowing once more. Memory four, Argyle Square, the colour is green. The bowling club once dominated the space. Around it were benches where old men sat under very tall trees, so tall and broad that they immersed the whole thing in a shade of green, deeper than any I can now imagine. And across Argyle Square, Houses could be glimpsed, houses whose yellowing upper floor lights went on in the early evening. Houses in which lives were lived in rooms lit by such lights. Each autumn the whole square was covered by masses of piled golden leaves dripping with diamond droplets of cool rain. And the paths crossing? Enigmatic. Someone stood there in its centre one late afternoon in the spring of 1967, dreaming of a journey across the world that was due to begin a few weeks later. This someone stood there knowing that the journey itself would never match this moment. The faltering light, the first star, the trees in bud, the still cold fear of the unknown. Memory five, blue, Melbourne Cemetery. Fog, a hearse drives along a narrow roadway as my family and I stand on its edge, done with the mystery of this event, the death of a loved one. We know something has changed through this, something no longer holds, is gone, perhaps never was. 
In an early April chill, we watch soil being heaped on a wooden casket and we walk away without ever knowing what it was that we wanted to say to each other. Last year, I stood in the same spot after spending hours searching for it. Tiny it was. The plaque and words, tiny, insignificant. But then, whose life isn't? The words are from a Pierpaolo Pasolini poem written in Friulian, a northeastern Italian dialect, titled The Song of the Bells. It speaks of a soul who comes across a stranger as it glides over the plain on its way home. In my sweet flight, I am a spirit of love who to his land returns from afar. The gliding one whispers reassuringly to the stranger. My grandmother would never have believed in Pasolini's poetics, but then she would not have minded the essential truthfulness underlying this poem either. After all, she was born in the same Friulian village that Pasolini's mother came from. She's been resting here in the Melbourne Cemetery since 1971, listening to trams rolling by in winter and birds twittering in spring. A few months after the plaque was placed on the head headstone, all the dark green cypresses lining the cemetery's eastern border along Ligon Street were cut down. The winter sunshine flooding from the east each morning now warms the crumbling brown soil she rests in. Only recently, her resting place was vandalised recently, I mean, two years ago, and the plaque has had to be replaced. But it has imprinted on it the very same words, as well as a cross I made for her in case the plaque was taken away again. It's paradoxical, my insistence on, on having a plaque when it's so transitory, when it can just be taken away, and when very rarely does anyone visit the gravesite except me. To keep her company, last year I also implanted in the soil next to her grave, <coughs> a cross for me, with my name and my birth date and the city I was born in. No ending date yet, but of course it will come. But I just wanted to amusingly get ahead of the game and warn counsel whoever it is that decides these things that I'm ready. Look, my cross is already there, keeping my grandmother company. <clears throat> Until tomorrow for the remaining three memories of Ligon Street. Until then.